go ahead and get started, and I'm going to use the microphone because uh, HCAM is here today. Our local cable station is here to record this. Obviously, uh, really special opportunity for all of us here at Hingham High School to welcome a very special guest. I am thrilled that so many of you are able to be in here. The room obviously filled to capacity and actually a little bit beyond its capacity. This was a very popular item for our faculty when we put it out there for teachers who are interested in coming down. And for those of you who've been able to read about Bobby Joe Leister or view the Chronicle episode that profiled his fascinating case, you have a really good idea already why this was such a draw for our teachers and, and for you as our students to come down here. I'm thrilled to welcome Bobby Joe Leister to our school and we owe this to um, Chris Muse, who is standing to my left here and I asked him how I should introduce him and he's gonna introduce Mr. Leister in a moment. Uh, he's so humble that he would only tell me, well, I'm Jack's dad. And so Jack Muse is here. Uh, Jack is a student here at Hingham High School. This is his dad. He also is a justice of the Superior Court um, and has been a justice in the Superior Court for many years. Before that, he was a trial attorney for many years. Before that, for a brief time, he actually was a teacher in Boston as well. He's had uh, a very accomplished career. He also teaches now uh, as a professor at Boston College Law School. And he's done some amazing work over the course of a long career, and he's got several claims to fame. One of them certainly is the marvelous work that he did in helping to win the release of Bobby Joe Leister, who you're about to meet. But to hear more about Mr. Leister and the great work that led to um, him being here today, please welcome to our school uh, our own Hingham, fellow Hingham resident and justice, uh, the Honorable Christopher J. Muse. There's a trick to everything. I think I got that trick. So thank you, Mr. Swanson, and thank you, students, for uh, showing the interest uh, that you have uh, for some of the things that I'm going to be speaking about. As Mr. Swanson indicated to you, I'm a, I'm a judge in the Superior Court. Uh, and before that, uh, I think it's 17 years coming up at the end of this week. And before that, I was a lawyer for 25 years. And before that, actually, I was a teacher in Boston for almost seven years. And so <clears throat> I'm going to mix and match each and every one of my prior uh, professions in the next 15 minutes or so with you. Um, I'll start off with being a judge. Um, one of the uh, nice releases from the job is to be able to go out and speak to community groups and especially student groups. And I've been doing that for a long, long time. And I'm encouraged to do it. So. Um, just like you got uh, an hour away from the classrooms, no tests for this, by the way, um, I got a morning away from my job. Uh, and I really enjoy being here with you. And, and what they do is they, they ask me to come out and speak to you about uh, the rule of law. Uh, May 1st was Law Day. We were scheduled to be here on May the 2nd. Uh, and, it, and, and it's a day set aside every year to celebrate the rule of law, which I'm going to describe for you in a moment. And then I'm going to dig back a little bit and talk to you about uh, how I was a lawyer, when I was a lawyer, and for 25 years I did an awful lot of defense work. And I'm going to be telling you about the very first case that I got um, a week after I quit teaching. and. Uh, entering my brand new profession as a lawyer, how I uh, began to represent Bobby Joe Leister. You're going to learn about Bobby Joe Leister. Uh, Bobby, uh, for 16 years, uh, excuse me, for the past 28 years, has been a street worker. Would you turn around just for a second, just to show you? And special ops, special ops, these are all my I have a lot of little visuals for you. He is eyeballs deep in the toughest communities in Boston with the toughest at-risk students and kids, the kids that never even thought about becoming students, the ones that aren't just shooting each other every single day, but yesterday he went to a funeral for one and tomorrow he's going to another and it's repetitive. And he is in the middle of all of the chaos that you folks are lucky enough just to read about. And before that, he was a con convict. He was convicted of murder and armed robbery. 
and he spent 16 years in jail. Um, so our paths obviously converged at some point. But let me, let me first of all set this up. I want to be a teacher for a few minutes with you. Uh, all you history teachers out there, you'll like this, Mr. George. It's good. Where is Mr. Swanson? I told you, I, it's dig, digging deep. And when I talk about the rule of law, it, it's a real simple concept. It just means that it applies to everybody. And it's historical, and it's, it's got real strong historical roots right here in, in this area of Massachusetts, because the person that epitomized the rule of law was John Adams. He lived down the street just a bit, maybe 10 miles away in Quincy. And there were three or four things that he did that was really of great significance. First thing is, he's very famous for being one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence. The second thing is, he was an author not only of the Massachusetts Constitution, but also the United States Constitution as well. I have a book that uh, contains the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And Bobby and I uh, went out and bought enough of these for every one of you. And I'm hoping that if you take it, our gift to you, that you'll read it sometime and it's in, in its entirety. But let me tell you about John Adams. Um, he was a homie. You know what a homie is, right? No, what are the homies? <laughs> homie's a homeboy. You ever hear that? No. Uh, no? no? Nothing about a homeboy? No. Nope. Well, it's a Hingham slang word. <laughs> uh, it, it, it means someone that grew up in your hood. You know what I'm talking about? Well, <laughs> hood is a slang word in Hingham for neighborhood. So okay. what we mean by that is John Adams grew up in our neighborhood 10 miles away 250 years ago. And so he's our homie. Now do you get it? Okay, Does that make sense to you? Okay. Yeah, I get it. So John was a lawyer. 1770, he was a brilliant lawyer. He was probably the number one lawyer in all of greater Boston. And he had a thing called and my history friends will agree with me, inaptly described as a Boston Massacre. And what happened in the Boston Massacre was that a whole mob of people, none of whom were really nice people, they all worked on the docks, um, had a lot of anger towards the British soldiers that were occupying their city, and, and justly so, and John Adams absolutely agreed these soldiers should not be there. But, uh, the mob started throwing rocks and snowballs and sticks at four or five British soldiers, redcoats, and they opened fire on them and shot three or four, uh, quite a few, but actually three, four or five of them ended up dead. And hysteria followed, as you would expect. Our citizens are killed by law enforcement. And we don't trust law enforcement. And they were massacred, is what everyone said. And they turned that event into a highly charged, politicized event where, yes, they did fire their muskets, and yes, five people died. But before you said that they're murderers and hang them, there's a thing called due process of law that, that stands in the middle. And none of the lawyers in Boston with any credibility, wanted to step up and represent the enemy of the people. But one person did, and that was John Adams. So John Adams was successful in raising the defense. It was obvious. It was an element of self-defense. It wasn't premeditated. And several of them were charged or convicted of a lesser charge of manslaughter. So John Adams stood up for the right to representation. Later on, John Adams wrote probably the most important sentence that's right after the introduction to the Declaration of Independence. And um, see if I can do it from memory, sort of. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable, that's unremovable, irretrievable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, you know, if you guys want to stay out after midnight some night, 
Tell your mother, father, that you have the unalienable right to happiness. And this is going to make you happy. So, you know, this will give you a chance to... That was funny. Okay. However, I want you to remember what he said. All men are created equal. And that's a, that's a principle that we're striving for. And then the third thing that stands today is I want to speak to you as a school teacher about the rule of law and why the law applies to everyone is John Adams said in the Declaration of Rights that we have in our state that this is a government of men, excuse me, a government of law and not of men. Breaking apart histories and histories and histories and histories of time where it was a government of kings and rules and dictators. This is a government of laws. And then the next thing that I want to lead into and stop is the Fifth Amendment of our Constitution. And it's the one that I live by in terms of my profession, both as a judge and as a, as a lawyer. And that is that no person shall be denied due process of law. That is, there will be no taking of life or liberty without due process of What does it mean? It means the right to a fair trial. It's a right to process, fair evidence, fair adjudication, have a jury decide, have an independent person that's unbiased decide. That's what we call by due process of law. So Johnny, since he's a homie, I can call him that, stood for an awful lot of wonderful, wonderful things that none of us should take for granted. And the reason I use that last sentence, none of us should take it for granted, is because my dear friend of 40 years, Bobby Joe, didn't get adequate representation. He was not treated equally before the law. And he was denied fundamental due process of law. He didn't get fair treatment. He didn't get a fair trial. He didn't get fair appeals. And there's a lot of reasons for it, too many to, for me to explain in great detail. But things such as, such as uh, race, um, things such as disenfranchisement, um, things such as bad public attitudes, prejudices, were part of the whole background as to why this beautiful man went to jail for 16 years of his life for a crime that he did not commit. So now, let me segue a little bit and tell you about what happened to him. I'll try to be very brief because I think you saw some of the things about the case in the Chronicle piece, and you might have read about it in other sources. But on September 27, 1970, Talbot Avenue, which is over by Codman Square, I believe, in Dorchester, there was a robbery at 4 o'clock-ish in the afternoon. And a woman by the name of Kathleen Whiteside was at the counter. And two fellows came in. And one of them had a 22 caliber long barrel pistol, put it right in front of Mrs. Whiteside, and said, give me all the money that you have. Her husband, Levi, saw what was happening, came out from a back room, went immediately to the defenses of his wife, and took a, a heavy coffee mug and whacked the gunman on his head. And the gunman shot him, took the money, and the two of them ran, and possibly a third. A description was taken from Mrs. Whiteside, who saw her husband at the time on the floor with blood all over him, lifeless. And the description, which was taken from him that went over the airwaves, was this. It says, wanted for armed robbery and murder at Talbot Variety Store, two unknown colored males, six feet tall, one wearing a black shirt and green pants and a black scully cap, both dirty looking and needing shaves. I gotta stop for a second. This man is GQ quality. This is gentleman's, you know. He would no longer be unshaven than he would to, to shoot himself in the head. He would never wear dirty clothes, never did, never will. Police, an hour later, patrolling over where Boston Symphony Hall is, if you 
towards Fenway Park, really, um, in the South End, see Bobby Joe, who's wearing a black cap, and he was wearing a beautiful, beautiful, well-pressed black shirt and some green trousers. And the police stopped on that information and arrested him. Said, you're wanted for armed robbery and murder. Now, I'm going to stop for a second. This would be like you folks being here and um, being arrested for a crime that was committed at Weymouth, on the other side of the Southeast Expressway. Just think about it. And think about the clothing and everything else that you folks could have worn that would have been, I don't know, look at these guys here. Dark shirt, dark shirt, clothes, he's wearing sneakers, he's wearing a dark shirt, light shorts. Oh, I got four suspects right here. All of you will be arrested for murder. For wearing white shorts. Because he was wearing a black hat, and that's what it did for him. So he was arrested for it. And he was taken down the police station, and several things happened. First of all, they took this picture. This is not a six foot tall guy. This is not a guy that has a dirty looking shirt on. This is not a guy that needs a shave. In fact, he didn't shave until his second year in Walpole State Prison. And the police made all sorts of misrepresentations and misstatements that caused an identification to be a faulty one. When he was arrested, he had a couple of dollars. The guy with the mug, excuse me, the guy that got hit with the mug that had a big bruise in his face, he didn't have no bruise on his face. The guy that was shooting in the scuffle lost a bowl of a watch. This guy was wearing a Timex watch. That night, the police said to him, Bobby, would you do us a favor and would you give us both of your hands? We want to do a test on your hands to see whether you recently fired a gun because you have a thing called the gunpowder residue test. He says, take these hands and do it because I didn't do anything. And, of course, he came up, no gunpowder. So the guy that shot the man probably would have had a whole blast of gunpowder all over his hand. Bobby didn't have it. Well, there was a host of other things that happened, and I'm not going to tell you about them because there's too many details. Um, because when he was tried, six or seven months later, a jury was given two things to decide. And I want you to think how enormous both of them are. They had to determine whether he was guilty of murder, and of course, you know, they found him guilty of that. And if so, should he be put to death? Because we had a death penalty. And of course, you can see that he's living and breathing, and the jury decided not to impose the death penalty. So we went off to jail, and in a few minutes, he's going to tell you about what that was like. And six or seven years later, I came into his life because I was a young lawyer, didn't know very much about the law, really. In fact, he was the very first case that I got because I went to work for my father. Um, and we spent nine and a half years working to get him freed. We went up and down all the federal courts, in and out of the state courts. We got, we got people telling us they were very, very tired of us doing it. Um, we didn't miss a meal, so um, when people ask you, you didn't get paid, you know, well, we didn't miss a meal, so it didn't make any big difference. Um, and finally, 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 and later on, someone's going to raise their hand, I hope, it's a plant for one of you, say, well, how do you get them out? Because I want to tell you that story if you have some time. But what I want you to understand is, over nine and a half years, I, my family, uh, my father, my brothers, my sisters, everybody, we all joined together to figure out a way of getting this guy out. And we finally, finally did it um, by virtue of a whole lot of wonderful coincidences. So what I want to do right now is I want to stop. I think I gave you enough information to know what happened. You probably have my understanding of my feelings. Now, that's one thing I don't miss. <laughs> Probably understand my feelings about how unfairly he was treated. But I will say to you that uh, out of all of the bad things that happened in his life and all the work I know I and my family put into this thing, we have a wonderful reward. And the wonderful reward is this man 
and the story he's going to tell you. So, Bobby, please be my guest. Uh, first, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you young people today and to tell you about my, uh, my life story and everything, what happened to me, you know, uh, when I first arrived here in Boston. Uh, I graduated from uh, high school in Alabama. I went to all black school. Uh, I had a scholarship, a basketball scholarship to Jackson State, a four year basketball scholarship to Jackson State. Um, I turned it down. Uh, my senior year, the scout from Jackson State, they were coming to our game and uh, my last two years of school, I was scoring over 40 points every game. Every game I scored 40 points. So they decided to give me a scholarship to Jackson State. So I turned it down to come to Boston to uh, live with my, my family that already had been there for about 15 years. So I said, uh, I've never been up north. I said, uh, I'm going to go back to school later on in my life. Now at that time, I'm only 18 years old. And I'm, I'm just leaving. I'm just leaving my mother and father, you know. So I came to Boston in 1969, and then 1970. Uh, that when my life took took the turn for the worse. They arrested me for a murder that I didn't do. You know, uh, they gave me a, a fifteen thousand dollar bail for first degree murder. Back in those days, right? You know. It was only $750 to get out on bail. Today, you don't get a bail for murder. You know, uh, my family got the money up and got me out. And uh, I went back and forth to court the whole year 1970, knowing that, I, that they didn't have no evidence against me. But the, I was represented poorly. The lawyer I had really didn't do anything for me. So they found me guilty of circumstance evidence. You know, they didn't find no fingerprints, no money, nothing, but they found me guilty. And uh, like Mr. Mew said, that uh, they had the death penalty here, and uh, the jury says to the, the, uh, the, the jury, do y'all impose the death penalty? They said, no, we're going to waive the death penalty. We're going to send this young man to first degree life at, at Walpole State Prison. And it was in 1971. I was turning 19 years old. I was totally confused. You know, I didn't really understand anything at that time. You know, as they, as they put me in the, in the paddy wagon, and was taking me to Walpole, uh, one of the guards said, Papa Joe, take a good look at this city, because you, you'll never see it again. So you'll probably die in prison. And fortunately, he almost was right. Because three months after I was locked up at Walpole, I was playing ball in the gym, and the guy said something about my mother, and at that time, my mother was, was really sick. So I took offense to that, and we got to fighting, and they broke us up. And he ran out and, and, and came back with a, with a shank, what they call in prison. It's a knife out here, but they, they make shanks in prison out of butter knife and, 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 and forks and stuff like that. He came back and waited for me to finish playing basketball. So after I finished, I was all sweating and everything. I said, I'm gonna go take a shower. So as I walked out the gym, he stuck me three times in the back, right? And it's said three months after I was locked up, right? And me and him were tussling and, and I was getting weak and I, I, I fell on the floor and blood was gushing out of my back. You know, I lost a lot of blood. And uh, the correction officer said that yeah, well, we're, we're going to have to call this young man family, so he's not going to make it. But as I lay in my own blood, right, I'm, I'm praying to God. I'm saying, is this is the way that my life going to end at 19 years old? You know, I'm already here for a murder I didn't do. Now, you're going you gonna to have somebody to take my life after three months? Then I decided, I said, well, God, if, if, if you're ready to take me, take me. Even at 19 years old, I'm ready to go. If this is your will to take me at 19, I'm ready to go. You know, even though you know I didn't do anything. 
but not knowing that God had planned for me. He had planned for me. I, I, stayed, I stayed in the hospital for about six months till I got my strength back. And they shipped me from Walpole to Norfolk. And I, I stayed at Norfolk for about seven years. And that's when Chris and his father came into my life. And that was a way of God sending somebody to help me. That's why I love the Muses. They like my family, right? Because Chris came up to see me. And the first thing I said to Chris when I walked in the visiting room is that I'm innocent. Now, I'm no, I'm no longer 19 years old. I'm 27 years old now. I'm a grown man now. And I said, I'm innocent, man. I said, I've been up for seven years. I didn't do anything. You know, and Chris said, I believe you, Bobby Joe. And I just, just met him. He was just getting out of law school. So Chris went back and talked to uh, his father, the late Robert Mute, who I love. God wouldn't, don't know how much I love that man, you know. And uh, he, he talked, talked to his dad, and they read my transcript, and they started working on my case. And like he said, it took them nine years to get me out because they kept turning us down. Every time they put a pill in for me, what, about four or five times? Yep. They, they turned us down. And finally, they, they, they granted me a new trial. And the day that they granted me a new trial, Chris and his dad came up to Basic Correction Center, which was outside of Norfolk, right? When, when they came up and, and they said, Bobby Joe, you have a visitor. I came downstairs, they both were smiling and they had a paper in their hand. I just felt that that was my freedom right there. I just felt it and they told me. You know, they gave me a hug and everything. They said, they, they granted you a new trial. So you're gonna be getting out. You know, and, and sure enough, you know, a few days later, I went to court. They dismissed my case. They dismissed my case, and, and we had a big part and everything over Chris House and all this stuff there, and it was wonderful. And for four years, I was doing construction work in the city with a private contractor. But in 1990, I landed this job here, street worker job, city of Boston. I worked for the mayor. Now, when I first got this job, uh, they told Chris, they said, the job going to last for two years. I've been here 28 years already. I'm getting ready to retire from the job in a couple of years. I'm 68 years old now. In a couple of years, I'll be 70. I'm getting ready to retire from this job. That's how long I've been here. But I've been working with, I've been working with teenagers for the last 28 years, high-risk youth, gang members. Um, sadly to say, I done been to over way over 900 funerals, way over 900. The first funeral I went to was, was a 14-year-old uh, 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 girl, Tiffany Moore, they killed on the mailbox. She was only 14 years old. That was the first one. You know, and then they just started having, it was, the teenagers was killing one another so, so much in the city that in the 90s, in the early 80s, until we developed, in my program, we developed uh, a funeral detail. You know, people that we go to the funeral. They had me. They said, Bobby Joe, we want you because the young people, they, they want to go up to the catheter and pull the, pull the, the person out the catheter and hug them and all that's up there. They said, Bobby Joe, we want you to guard the catheter. So I had to stand up there like this and guard the catheter. Make sure that they didn't reach down in the catheter. I did that for years. You know, and, but, out of all the things that, that I, as long as I've been working as a street worker, right, I have helped a lot of young people like yourself, a whole lot. You know, a lot of guys, right, that I went to the high school and was speaking, and after I spoke, a few years later after they got out of school, they, they went to the police academy and they became police officers right today. They are police officers. You know, and, and they see me on the streets now and they stop and shake my hand, they said, Man, if it wasn't for you, when you came and spoke at Malcolm Park High School when you first got out, I don't know where I would be today. He said, you changed my whole life. And a whole lot of people come up to me right today. 
And I've been out of jail for now for over 32 years now that I've been out. You know, and I've been working with young people like yourself. 